Welcome to the case go through. Uh, we're going to be focusing on this question called Pale Company. It's a typical uh, section A question. Uh, I've taken 40 marks from this question here. First of all, you've got a background of the case. And second, we've got different exhibits. So, for example, exhibit one, we've got the requirement there. So, during the audit planning stage, it says, Provide you with some of the information uh, to help with your planning as a new or the clients of our firm and of course that will be a detection risk in the audit risk component okay it's a component detection risk inside the audit risk we need to spend extra time and efforts in auditing and checking the clients company called payroll call and there might be potential misstatements materially affected it, uh, its account in some way. And um, you should be aware that the management team is planning for uh, planning to achieve a stock market listing within the next two years. And that's why the company may have very aggressive business plans in some way that may lead to a potential business risk. Oh, therefore, evaluate the business risk to be considered in planning the audit. So remember, in our exam, 10 marks here, how many business risks that you are, uh, you are expected to identify. If I were you, I would like to pick up five points for that, because I know that each business risk may constitute two marks per point. So five business risks would be absolutely enough there. So for a business risk question, which means the risk that clients profit may go down, I decide to use the two steps approach. First of all, I will taking the uh, I'll be taking the case information as a step number one, and also as a subheading. And then as a step number two, it may go wrong on stating the impact. For example, reduction in profit or revenue of a client's company cash flows problems, damaged reputations, problems with a sound control system, and the drain of management time resources. So in other words, uh, management may uh, be spending more time on those areas uh, that should have spent the, uh, the, the same amount of time in other areas to earn profit, but not in this case. So therefore, as you can see, the business risk is talking about the client's profit. It's not talking about the impact on the financial statements at all. Make sure so you're ready for that. And after that, let's see the part boy. Evaluate the business, uh, evaluate the audit risk for planning of the payroll code. 20 marks here. How many points that you are expected to write? Well, if I were you, I would focus on possibly seven audit risks because I would deem that each would be worth at three marks and therefore for each point you're going to write I will follow the very well designed approach so for example for audit risk or risk of material statements I will use the four steps approach here for the majority uh, of, a, of a case information. Uh, and of course, for detection risk, we can't use the four steps, but for the new clients, the detection risk, uh, we simply use, for example, what, and there's a risk as a step number four, two steps for the uh, detection risk. And also for control risk, on the other hand, we also use the step one and step four. Uh, in, 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 in terms of, for example, the finance director has left the business and so on, they say that it's what as a step one and a step four, and that will be a risk that the accounts may go wrong. But for the inherent risk in particular, uh, except for the problems uh, in, for example, management bias, fraud, and that kind of stuff, we use the two steps, step one, step four. But related to the IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standard, that the examiner is heavily focusing on, we also need to apply another two steps here. Step two, confirm the materiality. 
Of course, we'll need to determine the materiality at the start. Uh, and then we're going to be seeing whether or not the balance uh, would be material here. And also confirming the IFRS requirement as well. Please do remember, you are not required to quote a specific IFRS number. You don't uh, be expected to say IFRS number 16 leases. But you are expected to say per IFRS leases. You are not expected to write out the full IFRS name, so for example, uh, the ICE number 37, provisions, contingents, liabilities, and contingent asset. You are expected to write out, for example, if we are talking about the contingent liability per IFRS contingent liability, that would be absolutely fine now. So, uh, that's all we can do. And of course, according to my experience, nowadays, that the examiner would delegate the materiality in a planning stage to be three marks. As I explained before in the previous sections. And therefore, for materiality, for the calculation, we would deem a two mark and the rationale, I'm going to set this one mark. So three marks within that 20, I've got 17 marks left for the audit risks. So possibly in this particular requirement, five to six points, you will score very good marks in this particular question. So please do remember, again, in this exam, you're not expected to write too much. If you're writing too many points, so make sure that the points quality are good, are high enough, otherwise you will score very low marks in the exam. Here's the note provided by the examiner, you need to follow it. For a complete timber plantation asset, you're only required to con consider the audit risk related to the changes in fair value. So in other words, you're not really required to consider audit risk related to simple stuff. So for example, timber plantation asset, uh, how much the business spend money in buying that asset, whether or not the timber plantation asset actually belongs to the entity to confirm its ownership and that kind of stuff. You are not required to comment on those. You are only required to comment on the changes in fair value. Any other relevant audit risk relating to the timber plantation asset will be dealt with separately later in the planning stage of your audit. And that's why you are not required, as I said, to confirm the ownership and the amount of expenditure and so on. You need to watch out. Very important in there. Part of C then. Decide audit procedures to be performed related to the changes in fair value caused by the recent storms. Okay. So it seems that it's been causing the impairment of those assets in some way. Your procedures include those relating to the evaluation of experts appointed by management and the work that they've, they've performed. Okay, so what you need to do is to focus on the expert work. And this is, a, I, I, I would say, it's a typical habit by the examiner is to confirm whether or not their expert is reliable in some way. And therefore, we're going to be performing the procedures in that. So instead of simply saying, diving into the fair value according to IFRS 13, fair value measurements, confirms the exit price and the valuation techniques and so on, but we should be primarily focused on whether or not the expert is reliable, obtaining the qualification, confirming the ethical status and so on, unless otherwise the examiner said you're not required to comment on those. But here, we should comment on those. Of course, six marks, I would aim to score three marks out of six for part C, because for the audit procedures questions in the actual exam, the examiner always commented that the uh, student's performance are not particularly good in some way, okay, because most of them may not have practical experience in audits before. 
And therefore, I would aim to score three out of six. Okay, but I'm going to deem one mark per point in this requirement. Finally, four professional marks. We should get these marks in the exam, but how? Look at my answer here. As I said before, four professional marks. You need to have a heading saying that this is the breathing note constitutes 0.5 marks and then two from the subject, especially for a subject part uh, you can use the keyword, for example, part A, this is risk and then comma and then audit risk, comma procedures related to the fair value the change results and so on okay, and that's all you can do the subject, very important there, 0.5 and then, you will need to have a one-sentence intro, introduction of other words. So you can say in your briefing notes, this briefing note explains the audit risk, business risk, and the procedures related to that part. That's it. One simple sentence will constitute one mark. And then, uh, of course, you will also need to focus on the structured answer as well. Very important. Usually what I tend to do is, is I clearly lay it out to the examiner this is the part A and this is the part B and this is the part C. At the same time, I would use quite a lot of headings as well and to make sure the examiner can follow our answer very easily. One mark here. And then for the clarity of your answer, very important in that. So uh, the clarity of your answer, what I tend to do is I follow the necessary approaches uh, so to make sure the answer looks very clean. And of course, in your answer, particularly if you copy the information from the case, for the second part, you are adding your explanation or assessment in that. And therefore, if I were you, I would like to bold or make the test to be italic or underlying it is entirely up to you and to make sure that the examiner uh, knows that the second part here you are adding your thought that's very important it's not the entire paragraph so you copy from the case but some marker will simply have a look at your answer okay the first part you're copying from the case information and um, that's fine but um, the examiner or the marker may lose his or her patience in reading the second part of your answer and deeming that the second part of your answer is taken from the case as well. That's not a good job. That's not a good thing as well. That's why we make the test to be italic or bold it to make it look clean. So, very important in that. And of course, at the conclusion at the end, again, one sentence would be absolutely enough. So I would conclude whether or not risks are high or low, and that's all you can do. Finally, very difficult to spot this risks prioritization. If I were you, I don't focus on this because I, if I read the case, of course, I would bring the risks into my answer, that's it. I would lose one mark. Yes, it's fine. I can score three out of four. Absolutely fine that to pass your exam. But of course, if you're a brilliant student, of course, when you have practiced lots and lots of past examination questions that you subsequently identify that these risks are important, okay, you put it first, before the second risk and before the third risk, and so on. To prioritize the risk will award you with another one mark. That's how we score the, the professional marks, for example, is, as you can see, we've got a breathing note here, two from day subject and an intro. And clear headings, for example, part A for business risks, I bold it and underlying it with a subheading. Subheading and so on. Okay. Of course, we come to the part boy audit risk evaluation and so on. So 
I would recommend my students to at least leave a line for each paragraph. Because in that way, you make your answer look very clean and it helps the marker and of course you will be awarded more potentially in your exam. Of course at the end, you can also see the conclusion as well, but uh, if I were you, I would simply use one sentence for that, but uh, to show fully of your answer, of course, uh, I, I've, I've used a couple of sentences, but in the exam, just one sentence will be absolutely enough. For example, uh, the business risks and audit risks, whether or not they're high or low, uh, so that you comment on that. Okay then, now, not particularly difficult, yes? And now let's dive into the case information now. First of all then, looking at the background of the case, this is given by the uh, examiner directly, rather than click on the exhibit, but you can see this background uh, automatically. Pelco owns and manages several large timber plantations. 5% trees are harvested, so it seems that it's applying the ice number 41, agricultural accounting. The company immediately processes the timber harvested from the failed trees in its own sawmills. It's just to be a factory where we're cut trees, in other words. Um, a facility where trees are processed into logs and other timber products. The processed timber, which is mainly logs and planks of wood, is then sold to a range of customers, including construction companies and furniture manufacturers. So in other words, when we cut the trees and we then make it to be the furniture, and then at that particular time, the ice number 41 agriculture stops to be applied and we need to apply the ice number two inventories thereafter and approximately 30 percent of the timber is exported so in other words we may focus on uh, for example the change in the forex which means the foreign exchange rate uh, accounting may be applied it may use the wrong rate to reach harm's rate certain balances, for example, for asset and liabilities and so on, and the income and expenses, uh, according to item number 21, for example. Okay. Now, potential audit risk, if you can comment on. That's the part boy, potentially, you can comment on that. Your firm was appointed as an auditor following the resignation of the previous auditor, uh, Hair Associates. Okay, as part of your client's acceptance procedures, communication was received from the predecessor auditor, indicated the reason was due to the retirement of a partner responsible for audit, no issues to bring to your attention regarding the audit. This means that the professional clearance procedures have been perfectly done and therefore you accept as an auditor and you plan the audit. Pelco is a small internal audit department with two staff, reports directly to the company CFOs. Uh, it seems that internal auditors should report directly to the audit committee rather than to the executive director. And this is why I would say it's a potential audit risk in the part B due to the weak control. Because there might be potential fraud perpetrated by the CFO but it's been concealed or covered up by the internal audit department. Oh, the company doesn't, doesn't have an audit committee. Uh, so the executive directors and other non-execs are those charged with governance. So uh, the internal audit department reports directly to them. So we need to be more careful on that. So during the planning stage, of course, what we need to do, we are not asked about the responses to the uh, assessed risks. But as a part of the response here, we need to maintain professional scepticism. Or in other words, it increase the level of professional scepticism in some way to be very sceptical about any potential frauds and errors here. It is 1st July 20x5. You are managing the audit department, a firm of charter, charter certified accountant. 
assigning to the order of Peoko if the financial year ended 30th September 20x5. So what? It's before the year end, so it's like the interim, okay, interim period here. And we are planning the audit, perfect. Of course, certain uh, activities and controls may not be uh, implemented or put in place, for example, related to inventory counts and so on, because it's not at the year end. So everything is where we're going to be forecasting, in other words. So forecasting this. So in the previous sections that we've talked about the materiality calculation, remember? So because if we, I were to focus on the uh, interim account, we need to close that up. So it seems that uh, it is 1st July 20x5. If we are given directly the... Uh, the profit or the revenue, uh, I mean, up to 1st July 20x5, uh, just to be nine months uh, figures. So what we need to do is to divide into nine months and times by 12, and that will give us the estimated gross amount. Okay, But here we are not given. Luckily, the examiner has given you the following information, if you can see here. You can add this information into your, into your book. So, for example, with the projected profit before tax, $6.5 million, and the total asset for the entire year to be $5.55 million there. So, what you need to do, first of all, we need to calculate materiality at the start, okay, for the part boy. Very important in that. Because that will constitute three marks here. First of all, for a PBT, applying the range, 5% to 10%, and times by that, a projected total PBT, profit before tax, 6.5 million. So that being the case, 0 0.05 times 0.5, that becomes 0.325 million to 0.65 million to be material. At the same time, we've got the total asset in the SFP. So for PBT, it's material to the PL, and for total asset, it's talking about the effect on the SFP. And that'll be 1% to 2%. The total asset value $555 million. And that being the case for a range of uh, $5.55 million. So if I take 555 times by 0.02, that becomes $11 billion. That's the range that we calculated. Awarded two marks already. Uh, we need to explain the rationale. So this is a quite a standard approach from the exam's point of view that you need to follow. So if I were you, I'd like to pick up the lower range, or the lower part, 5% and 1% for that. So uh, the 5% of PBT And 1% of total asset, i.e. 0.325 million and 5.55 million are chosen as the Overall materiality level because this is the new audit client.
and therefore higher risks are involved. First year saw that uh, uh, we are auditing the clients' company and higher risks involved and therefore we're going to choose the lower figure. Okay? Three marks for that. Okay? Make sure that you're ready. Okay then, right, okay, so we are also given the uh, cash decrease by 33.8% during the year. It seems that would be one of the business risks that we can comment on in part A. And the inventory balance increased by 67.4%. It seems that it supports my imaginations that a client's company obtaining a listing status and therefore having the aggressive sales strategy in some way. Okay, now, we're also given the left-hand side, the exhibit, for example, related to a partner's email, notes from the meeting, notes from the phone call, you need to read them very carefully and bring the case information into your answer. Now, exhibit number one. As I said, that uh, the, all the engagement partner sends you an email, you're acting as the manager, and you need to answer part A, boy, and cut. Part A, B, and C there. Now, let's read the exhibit number two. It's the notes from the meeting from the CFO. Let's read the accounting policies of this kind's company. So, Mark Yock is the CFO, confirms that the company applies the requirements to ICE number 41, and the follows, for example, for standing timber, meaning the trees are growing in a timber plantation before they are being felled, our biological asset, that's fine, living asset in other words, measured a fair value less cost to sell, that's agreeing to the ICE number 41, the change in fair value less cost to sales including the P&O, yes, that's correct there. Failed trees are agricultural produce, okay, yes, this is, this is right because failed trees are dead. Uh, dead ones are measured, uh, are recognised as agricultural produce. Measuring at fair value less cost to sell at the point of harvest. Immediately after failing, uh, the trees are processed. So the value of failed trees are waiting, processing is minimal at any point in time. Okay, now, processed timber such as locks are measuring according to ice number two inventories because after the agriculture produce, we need to measure inventories according to ice number two. That's correct as well. A technical expert from the audit firm has confirmed that accounting policies outlined uh, appear to be appropriate in the context of a Pelco's activities and therefore we need to see that expert. There might be certain risks in that, for example, an expert is not competent at all. And that leads us to a part C of our requirements later on to confirm whether or not the expert is reliable in some way. Let's talk about uh, the bits and pieces here. So, so for example, the examiner has done you a favour here because the examiner has bolded the title, for example, first of all, is for the international expansion so you can comment on the business risks here. And then the second title, the second heading, Go Standard, you can also talk about the business, business risk in the part A. Third, contract with Royal Company talking about the business risk and so on related to part A here. And we're going to be understanding this because that's the requirement according to ISA 315, identifying and assessing the risks of material misstatement. So what you need to do is to understand the current company and its operating environment. So first of all, it's the international expansion. The power cost operations are currently based in its home jurisdiction. However, the board approved the acquisition of several large tropical for, uh, rainforests in Farland. It's a remote developing country. So it seems that it needs cash and damaging your liquidity. It's quite a remote developing country. Developing seems that the 
uh, the systems on um, the laws are not particularly mature so we need to consider the risk of failure of this particular project the expansion will allow the companies to process few types of timber for which the significant demand for luxury furniture manufacturers as find that the acquisition of areas of the rainforest will cost 25 million dollars well, it seems that 25 million dollars if I Compared to the total asset 555, so if I take 25 divided into 555, so that will account for 4% of the total asset. So it seems that it's quite a large investment that you're going to make. And the purchase is due to take place uh, in August 20x5, which means very soon, because now it's July. And the cost of 25 is equivalent, is equivalent to a fair value of the rainforest, and that's fine there. So we can uh, use that as the, as the uh, initial investment value there. The Farland uses the same currency, okay. And therefore, no forex risks that we need to comment on. So expansion is not creating any foreign exchange rate risk exposure to the company at all. And that's why uh, by seeing this, relating your answer directly to the case, no comment on the forex in the part boy. The purchase is being funded through a share issue to the existing and new shareholders, funding members of the family uh, of a company establishing the company 20 years ago. A share issue was the only option for funding the international expansion as the company is at the limit of his bank borrowing agreement. So in other words, it seems that if there are any problems in funding in a part A, that will certainly hinder the success or the progress of the uh, international expansion project. And that's why it's one of the other business risks that we need to, fo um, we need to talk about. An international development agency agreed to provide a grant of $20 million to help the company in its Farland expansion. Okay, this is a grant of $20 million. So in a part boy, we can talk about the government grant. Although it's not directly from the government, but we can apply the government grant, accounting treatment there. So for example, the $20 million, uh, we wish to credit the deferred income liability. There, there's a condition in that the expansion represents sustainable and ethical business practice. The grant is provided specifically for training the local workforce and building accommodation for workforce in a town near to the rainforest. So in other words, if our practice is subsequently found out or having risks that the practice is not ethical at all or not sustainable, so we may consider the possibility to refund the $20 million back to a government agency. And of course, this will constitute, first of all, the Part A business risk, because it will be a drain in our cash, or in the client's company's cash, because there will be a reduction in cash because the money is paid back. Second, an other audit risk in the Part B, it's simply because for repayment, uh, all you need to do is to perform the necessary accounting entries, for example, to, to remove the deferred income liability by crediting cash or to create a provision liability at least. So the provision accounting, according to IAS number 37, provisions, contingency liabilities and contingency asset may need to be brought to the examiner's attention here. The grant is due to be received in September and relevant expenditure will commence in November next year in other words. CEO is, uh, sorry, CFO is planning to recognise half of the amount received as income on the basis that it will cover some of the management expenses in planning the international expansion. That is not a very good excuse for that. 
because you're receiving it in September, which means at the year end, you can't simply recognize half of that as income. So clearly that will be a, an audit risk related to a government grant because 50% to be recognized as income is not correct in some way. So let's look at another heading, is the gold standard. The company is proud to have recently been awarded an industry gold standard accreditation for the sustainable uh, timber management. To achieve the gold standard, denoting the highest possible level of sustainable uh, timber management and ethical business practice, the company must adhere to a lot of standard. This, indicate, uh, this includes maintaining the biodiversity of the timber plantation, ensuring that rare spe uh, species of trees are not harvested, and that animals' habit uh, habitat within the timber plantation are, pre uh, are preserved. To maintain the gold standards, the one condition is at least 80% must be uh, sold, must be harvested, according to a strict standard set by the industry regulators. And the gold standard applies to all the company's activities, including the violent expansion. So it seems that the gold standard, what TV in the part A is withdrew. If this is the case then, uh, it seems that our subsequent revenue will be suffered. So we can comment on the business risk in the part A. The next heading is the contract with the royal companies. The company's revenue has increased due to a significant contract with a new customer called Royal Company signed on the basis that we received the gold standard accreditation for its timber. So we can link with the gold standard here if the standard is withdrew by the uh, relevant authority, the large contract or large amount of revenue in the future would be affected. A potential business risk here that we can talk about. Another heading is the legal case. We can talk about the business risk there. A group of employees recently commenced legal action against the company, claiming that breaches of health and safety guidelines. Okay, so you can bring this information here, and to say, the chances that the twenty million dollars of grant to be repaid is quite high. So you can comment on that, of course. The company made some redundancies this year. Of course, that's related to the uh, the Part B, I-37, related to provision accounting, some of the necessary expenditure that we need to provide for as the provision liability, putting pressure on the remaining staff to work harder to maintain productivity. And the employees are alleging that this has caused an increase in the number of accidents at work, some of which resulted in fatalities. And the company management and legal advisors believe that the legal claim to be $19 million is unjustified and would not be successful. So the CFO does not intend to recognise the provision liability for such claims or to make any disclosures at all in advance of statements relating to this issue because that's at the early stage. But that's not a good excuse for that. So what we need to do from the auditor's point of view, we need to check that $19 million very carefully to see what expenditure has been included, what expenditure shouldn't be included. So for example, the potential training expenditures and so on cannot be included there. Let's see the use of experts here. It's related to changes in fair value due to recent storms. Of course, we need to bring that into the part boy, okay, here, when commenting on the audit risk there. Okay. That's very important there. So related to the changes in fair value and inventories and so on. In the last months, Several storms caused damages to some areas of the timber plantation. An independent expert has been appointed by management to determine the extent of damage caused and to quantify any financial implications. 
including determination of, of the change in fair value of the standing trees, so which means the biological offsets damaged by the storms. The experts, of, of, of course, subsequently when we measure it, the changes in fair value are going to bring that to the PNO, in other words. The experts' report indicates a large number of trees being completely destroyed and many have been badly damaged. Based on the experts' report, management determined that the reduction of $70.5 million of the fair value should be recognised in respect, in respect of a timber plantation asset recognised in the SFP. So in other words, if you see here, $70.5 $70 million dollars will certainly exceed either 0.325 million regarding PBT and $5.55 million related to a total offset. And that's why you need to be very careful here to comment on the materiality issues. Okay, so let's look at our answer first of all. For business risk here, the subheading for the international expansion, you can pick up one to two points here. So for example, uh, for the foreign country for the first time, because that's remote, so adding your thoughts here, and uh, what would be the impact on the company? So for example, because that's remote, it's difficult for management team to perform regular visit, and therefore, controls are important. So you need to fulfill into detail to get, one, uh, get two marks for each point that you've made, very important there. Of course, you can also say that the laws and regulations in that particular foreign country will be quite different, and there's a risk of non-compliance because, as I said before, for a business risk, you can comment on any chances that are leading to the company's profit to go down, reputation being damaged, the liquidity position is not good, not being able to secure the finances on. But you can divide your answer, basically you can think about it, from the operations point of view related to strategy, from the finance point of view, unable to obtain sufficient finance, and from the laws and regulations point of view, unable to adhere to potential laws and regulations there. So it's a non-compliance risk, in other words. And of course, have, not having experience uh, for types of trees growing in the rainforest, because you uh, for the international expansion that you've acquired the rainforest. If you haven't got the experience there, there might be the risk of the project not being successful because the product is not as good as it should have been looked to be and drain on management time and resources in there. And that would be another business risk and having less focus in the home country's activities. So this is how you score two marks per point, okay, two, two, and two. But uh, from my perspective then, you need to comment on quite a lot of things because for the international expansion, the number of marks, the maximum marks may be limited to two to three marks. So make sure that you comment uh, on the whole picture of the case. So the second heading, I would like to pick up the second one, uh, indicated by the example is the GO standard accreditation here. The risk of not being able to be renewed. Uh, and therefore you can talk about the implications here. So for example, the new contract uh, accounted for lots of revenue this year would be affected. And of course, linked to ethical practices. If not, that, 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 that could be withdrew. But still be uh, hints from the case, that legal case brought by the employees. The customers may cancel contract later on. There will be a reduction of a large amount of revenue and cash flows as a result. Also legal case, okay, because the employees sued the company for $19 million. And of course, $19 million is quite material in nature, uh, and in, in, in this amount, of course. Um, of course, the... Um, the cash will be reduced as a result. Whether or not you are able to uh, obtain enough funding to pay for that expenditure, so you need to question about that. 
And also, the recent storms that damage asset, and what you can think about, may damage to destroy other timber plantations as well. So subsequently, if there's a fire, for example, okay, so you can damage all of that. So uh, because this may take several years to grow, and therefore, it may reduce future cash inflows uh, because we, we need to use the cash inflows. Uh, I mean, to sell the 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 the, the wood and, and the furniture and so on. Uh, but um, if trees are damaged, we can't have those products, and certainly our inflows in the future will be affected. As a result, of course, we will spend lots and lots of money to rebuild those trees and a drain on our cash position as well. So making sure that if you simply say uh, that the recent storms damage our trees and therefore potential costs incurred, um, the examiner may award you with one mark as a maximum, sometimes 0.5 marks, because you haven't added any details in that. So make sure they add details in that, because, because for trees it takes years to grow and there will be a reduction in future inflows and so on. Very important there. We can also talk about the liquidity uh, problems as well. So, for example, the case has given us $4.5 million of cash, um, and the, due to inflationary pressures, and management maintain a reasonable level of cash to manage the working capital uh, properly. But uh, if the cash balance is not properly managed, given those events happening, for example, the storm damaging the trees and so on, a drain on our cash and so on, unable to obtain the finance due to unable to issue additional shares and so on, of course, it will certainly impact on our liquidity as a result. The inventories increased quite a lot, uh, but um, if the inventories cannot be sold subsequently, um, and, and, and of course the working capital will be damaged and the cash position will be damaged as a result. Uh, if the $19 million needs to be repaid uh, for the, due to the industrial action continues, so it may pause the delivery of our product to the customer and the inventory balance is increased substantially. We can't sell those to customers and therefore our future profitability would be affected. We need to talk about the industrial action as well here. And uh, they sue us. This means that they don't work for us any longer, not sales for the business. And also affecting, affecting our export sales and uh, would be a quite a significant issue here. And uh, our customers, seeing this case, may be sourcing their product with an alternative supplier in the end and cancelled contract later on and further affecting our revenue. So we can talk about that. There will still be industrial action and therefore they stop working for the business, uh, leading to reduction in sales revenue in some way. Uh, and also cancelled contract by large customers in particular. And also a case uh, has reviewed in the, in, in, in the real case uh, study in the actual exam uh, the, the there's a, a payment reported in the media and it's the unusual payment seems to be a bribe to bribe the government authority. And if this is the case then, the gold standards may be withdrew uh, at some point in the future, very soon, affecting our contract and so on. This is not provided in, in, in our case in, in this book, but in the actual question that the incentive payment has been uh, has been given in the case anyway. 
So let's talk about the audit risk here. So for example, this is a new client. You don't have to say this is the detection risk, but for uh, tutorial purposes, I've uh, mentioned it to you only. You can say that this is the first year audit, not having experience and difficult to detect um, a team misstatement. Okay, so you award it one mark here. And for detection risk, so always talk about this to earn another mark. The opening balances of the financial statements and also comparative information that we need to work on those. So for example, the last year's account and so on to see whether or not those are correct in some way. If those are not correct, it will certainly have an impact on the current year's uh, financial statements figures. Because not audited by us and we plan to audit the opening balances and that's according to the ISA 510 initial audit engagement for opening balances that we need to do it, we shall do it, we have to do it in other words. So having these two points, as you can see, two marks here. So another way so you can talk about this is because that it operates in a specialised industry and given that we may not have experience in that particular company, uh, may not be quite familiar with the industry requirements and so on, it leads to an increased detection risk as a result. So you can also talk about that. Okay, so uh, one, two and three, just pick up two in any exam. If you see that's a new client, very important there. You can't simply write a sentence to simply get one mark, you lose another, that's not very good. You can also talk about the corporate governance because no audit committee, and that would be a control risk, but you don't have to say that in the exam. And as the internal audit team is quite small, reporting directly to the CFO, and therefore there might be certain transactions that, that, that has been manipulated in some way, and we need to make sure that the, uh, we allocate enough resources during the audit to check this item, to check this area, and to uh, make sure that we maintain professional scepticism, because it seems that the internal audit team inside the client's company is quite small not having enough resources to uh, check all the balances that from all the balances from there. And also the company is not a listed company and potentially is going forward to the stock market listing status. If this is the case then it will be a problem on the measure. It's just to be an other inherent risk to the account manipulation in some way. So putting my point as to step number one here, because that does not really involve any particular IFRS here. So the impact of this is that it may use the earnings management techniques. Okay? And this creates a risk that the accounts may be materially misstated. So we also need to fulfill the case information as well. So the project before tax is 30% higher than the previous year's figure in the actual exam. This information is given. And therefore, I wouldn't say that you have done a wrong job, a bad job, but I would say that this is quite a risky area that we need to consider here. So because you having the pressure to obtain listing onto the stock exchange and therefore you may use the techniques to manage your profit, in other words, earnings. And your accounts may be materially misstated and we've got the supplement, supplementary information from the case that your PBT 30% higher than the previous ones. Okay, so pressure on result. Another area that we can comment on is the government grant. First of all, we can talk about the materiality. $20 million is quite material because uh, it's quite material to the total asset here. Only 5.55 is our level. 20 above that, above that, so it's quite material. And then the step number two, 
because we're going to be applying the four steps approach regarding the IFAS related issues. According to the government grant, so I can say per IFAS government grant, you don't really have to say tutorial notes in your exam. It requires that uh, we receive the grant, we would credit the deferred income liability and subsequently recognised into the PL over the period related to the grant. For example, if the grant is for four years and we're going to release one fourth into the PL each and every year. And the risk is that uh, the transaction or the accounting entries are not properly done because the CFO decides to recognise half of that in the PL. That's not correct. So the impact on account, you must say that the impact on the PL, impact on the SFP, impact on the disclosure, potentially, separately. Okay. You can't simply say the financial statement would be misstated. No. You have to say that if you recognise the income too early, this means that your profit will be overstated in the PL. At the same time, the deferred income liability, which should have been recognised but not actually been recognised, and therefore liabilities will be understated. You need to say the impact on the uh, respective financial statements, for example, for PL and SFP, will be the actual impact on that or the potential impact on that. Either would be understate certain items or elements or overstate certain element or under disclosure of certain items very important in that how about for repayment for government grants because uh, there would be a condition on the ground that you need to follow this and need to follow that but if you're not following this of course uh, per the provision accounting uh, uh, of course, of course, item number 37, and you need to state the principle in that. So, I'm going to use a mnemonic for this. It's called POR, as I said before, a present obligation for O, and it's probable more than 50% chances that the cash will be repaid and the expenses could be reliably estimated. Otherwise, it's not meeting with the pre uh, probable criteria we need to disclose a contingent liability. So please learn this according to my experience because always in your exam the ICE number 37 would have a very very high possibilities to come up. Almost 90% of chance that you will see the ICE number 37. So learn this paragraph, very important in there. There is a risk that not considered by management to either provide the provision accounting or to disclose the contingent liability and therefore not providing the provision, account, uh, provision liability the liabilities will be understated alternatively the disclosure requirements disclosures are not adequately done okay so very important there so under disclosure in other words how about for a legal case for $19 million of the payment potentially to the employees suing the company? The $19 million, as I said, is exceeding the total asset of 5.55. And in your exam, you would say that exceeding $5.55 million is deemed to be material. Uh, and of course, um, the payment you can say this but you don't really have to say that in your exam because when we cover the ISO related to materiality from the external auditor's point of view we may set the materiality level by nature for certain items especially for example for some of the sensitive issues so for example the employees are uh, taking the legal action against the company and so on and uh, of course we may consider that to be quite sensitive in nature and that's why 
uh, will set a particular materiality level for that. But actually, as you can see, the claims by the employees are so high, and that's why the 19 million dollars is quite material in its amount. So we don't really say the nature stuff here, okay? We don't really need to say that in your exam, but you can, of course. And of course, according to your accounting treatment, the provision accounting, as I said, is the, from the previous paragraph, and the impact on accounts is that liabilities may be understated or under disclosure of such amount. How about for the reduction in fair value? So in other words, it's the change in fair value in that. So change in fair value, more than $70 million, of course, is higher than the $5.55 million is material, okay, by amount. So why this would be a case then? Of course, uh, the change in fair value there, uh, so if, I mean, the damage is caused by storms, and of course, there'll be a decrease in fair value, Decrease in fair value, so we need to recognize it as the impairment expenses or something like that, as an expense in the uh, PL. But um, the $70.5 million may not be recognizing the losses at all because the company is going to go list it on the stock exchange and therefore it may make the financial statements look much better. Recognizing that $70.5 million because the profit before tax, we only have got $6.5 million here, it will certainly turn the profit into losses. And therefore, having the uh, incentive to manipulate the account in some way will not recognize the losses in full because it will have a large impact on profit. Of course, this is not correct in some way. Uh, yeah, we can comment on that. Or perhaps another risk that the values that we obtain from the experts is not correct and the impairment on other assets rather than simply affecting these type of assets but other assets for example the roads and so on may be affected as a result because we acquire the rainforest for example and the damaged trees and maybe we build the roads on that the roads may be affected as a result and therefore, the impairment needs to be recognised. How about for inventories then? Inventories increased and uh, material and a coin to ice number two should be measured at low of cost and net realisable value. And if the industrial action continues, the timbers can't be sold. They need to be remeasured at net realisable value to recognise potential impairment losses in that. So potential impairment losses not being recognised, impacting on our account. So in terms of the uh, p and figures, and also the SFP figures related to inventory values. And if the storm, yes, causing a lot of damages to the trees, for example, going concern problems that we need to consider there. So whether or not your company can continue as a going concern basis because you will settle $19 million to your employees potentially and causing 70, more than $70 million of losses to your trees. So according to ICE number one, per IFI's uh, presentation of FS, it states that we need to disclose any uncertainty related to the company's going concern status. If this is not done, the risk of not doing this under disclosure of that. You don't really write, you don't really need to write so many points in your exam. So for example, if I were you, I had to pick up five points potentially, maximum seven. The audit risk, so we can talk about the materiality first of all, gaining three marks. Second, new clients will always say, okay, two out of three, get two marks. Corporate governance, pressure on result. For the government grant, yes, I'm familiar with this, but I'm not familiar with that, so I'm not going to write this. Legal case, familiar with this, four steps. Reduction in fair value, I think, I'm familiar with this, okay, just write that, so the other two, 
I'm not going to write them in your exam. Inventories, yeah, mm. may not bring to my attention. Not particularly sure about that. Then I read the case, so decide not to do that. But going concern, definitely you can go for it. So let's talk about the Park C of our requirements. Let's see what's required in the Park C. Let's see then. Park C. Design procedures to be performed to changes in fair value. To evaluate the expert is what? Well. So what we tend to do for procedures, as I said before, is one mark per point. A simple sentence will be absolutely enough. And all I could do is I'm going to include how to do it, which means the action I'm going to take, and what to check, and why we're going to be doing this. So first of all, I'm going to inspect the uh, experts report on the trees. That's very important. So you can't say we're going to obtain the report. We're going to obtain the report for what? On the value of those damaged trees. And why are you going to do that? Uh, you can pick up one from the three points here. You can understand the assumptions used to determine that value by the experts. Confirm the geographical extent so to determine the level of impairment losses. I'm going to confirm whether or not the tree has been completely that destroyed or partly destroyed so you can confirm the value as well to see whether or not that's reasonable. Okay? The assumptions and the number of them and the individual value, so very important. So first of all, you're going to confirm the method the experts have been using and the number of trees spread across different uh, countries or across different locations and the single value or the individual value of that. And of course, next one, you're going to inquire with the experts and to discuss with management. So we're going to discuss the experts. So discuss is the how to do it. Experts, methodologies, their method with management. Okay, so very, very important. That. So you can't say discuss with management to confirm the rationale. No, you can't score any marks in here. But discuss what? What is very important? Discuss the expert's method with whom? With management. Okay, so why are you going to do it? It's to, it's to confirm it's according to the IFAS requirement. Okay, their methods to value the trees. That's very important according to IFAS 13 in particular. Number three, obtain the experts' qualifications to see whether or not they are experienced in assessing the impairment losses and so on. And independent, whether or not experts are independent. And also physically visit the storm damages. Okay? Because it seems that we generate the, all the evidence from the third party. And this is, of course, reliable, but less reliable than auditors' generated evidence. Also discussed with management uh, regarding the actions related to the storm, what the actions they're going to take, because to determine those values, and of course, uh, there might be extra costs in that, so the extent of progress made to clear the destroyed trees, to, to see the cost incurred, and to harvest the damaged trees, and so on, and to maybe to discount them at a particular selling price. And uh, we're going to be seeing the fair value, so which means the values that you're going to obtain, if you discount it, of course, uh, it will certainly be a different value than it should be, compared to the market price. Obtain documentations related to potential sale of the trees to confirm the realizable value of that. As I said before, you can discuss with them and to obtain any particular pricing list for that. And from the non contested register, you can also confirm the current value of the standing trees 
So any potential fair value being recognised, that's important as well, because for trees, uh, there to be biological asset uh, to be included into non-current asset register. We've got a non-current asset register, the tree number one, could be seeing the current value for that, whether or not that matches with our county record. Okay, to confirm that the completeness of our auditor's assertion. We also can see a way that to use the auditor's experts to uh, confirm this amount, okay? So, because the amount seems to be quite a lot, which means quite material. Develop my understanding, the auditor's understanding of the fair value according to the IFRS and to compare with the management's estimate. So, for example, uh, if I were to confirm the value, yes, I look at the IFRS 13 guidance and I develop a range of fair value and to see whether or not the management's fair value falls into my range. If this is not the case, of course, I would say that your estimate may not be correct. Obtain the insurance policy to confirm whether or not the storm damage can be covered by the insurance in some way uh, so that we can reduce the amount of losses okay, for that um, potential receivables can be recognised here. Reading back to the requirement first of all for Part C is we are required to design procedures to change in fair value caused by the recent storms. And for recent storms, uh, so affecting the fair value of that, affecting the NRV, net realizable value, additional costs for that, we can check that, and also to see the expert methodology and qualification and so on. I would say that similar question, if they come up, these six marks here, you can at least score four, because quite a lot of that are standardized. If you uh, see other past examination questions, related to the part C here. But for another two marks, it will be very difficult to obtain because that really relates to the case. But for the expert one, uh, you will expect that very similar requirements may come up again. So make sure, learn the answer first of all, and then practice sufficient past examination questions, and you will score very good marks in this paper. Quite interesting and challenging question, I would say, I'm going to stop the recording now for this question for Pelco, and I look forward to seeing you in the next of our section then. Bye. APC, accounting for your future.